You're listening to State of Arrest. I'm William R. Moore. I'm here with Bill Dorenzo. We're South Florida criminal defense attorneys. We get a lot of calls or a lot of clients, I should say, that are arrested for battery. They find themselves into a, in a domestic violence courtroom and they want to know what got them there, per se, right? See, a, a simple battery that winds up in domestic violence court is carries all the same elements. It's just what, Bill, the relationship of the parties. You got it, relationship of the parties. Right, I and mean, what are some of those relationships? Um, I think we've got if you are related by blood or marriage, um, if you are living together as if you were a family. So that, that doesn't count roommates, right? There's no. got to be some intimate yes. relationship there. Yes. Right, if you yes. and I were in law school, we were roommates, and you socked me because I won a bet on the football game or something. Right. Just a regular batter. Right. You're going to find yourself in a regular county courtroom, not in domestic violence Not even court. a courtroom I wouldn't have turned you in <laughs> for fear of retribution. It's true. And then there's uh, another one if you have a child in common. So you don't have to be living together if you have a child in common. Right. Co-parenting can get a little bit different, though. If you're not co-parenting at the time and it's not a child in common, things get a little bit right. sticky when it comes to that. Right. But um, uh, when... The relationship of the parties involves a crime alleged where there's battery, aggravated battery, which we see often in terms of most common by strangulation, somebody sure, yeah. alleged to have put their hands around somebody's neck, right. whether or not any pressure is really apl- pr- applied, uh, pregnant females, uh, will find your, yourself in the, in the jurisdiction of the felony court. Right. Right. Um, minimum mandatories apply. Yeah, minimum mandatory. Just for example, for a simple battery case, um, you go into your first offense, you've never got arrested for anything ever, and you go into domestic violence court and you're charged with a domestic battery, you're looking at uh, a mandatory 26-week anger management course. you got to go once a week for six months. Right, if you plea. Yeah, well, yeah, if you plea. If you're found guilty, you that's play. a minimum, minimum mandatory. Yeah. And what else do we see minimum mandatory? And we see I mean, when it comes to misdemeanors. Now, a domestic violence charge can be a misdemeanor or a felony, which right. raises an interesting point in a second. But DUIs, DUIs, minimum mandatories, misdemeanor. Yes. The thing is about domestic violence is in our criminal justice system in Florida, it's the only area of criminal law where we've got designated judges and prosecutors and you know what I, I never thought about that until you mentioned it that's a really interesting right? point yeah that's the only courtroom like we don't have a courtroom that's specific to you know drug trafficking we don't have a courtroom that's specific to DUIs murder cases or for DUIs crying out loud. even yeah right there's more than them than anything else uh, and, yeah. and there's so many more minimum mandatories and so many more caveats with the DMV and the ever changing nature of sure. DUIs Drug trafficking, right? I mean, you would think, given the nature of, well, what are we going to have in drug trafficking cases? Confidential informants, sealed files temporarily, sure, right? Utmost discretion being needed, right? No, it's lumped in there in front of whatever assigned judge it is. But you do get an assigned prosecutor. But with misdemeanor batteries that happen to involve a relationship between the parties... Can amount to what we just said. Right. Child in common, co-parenting, intimate relationship, living together, related by blood, right? Blood or marriage, regardless of whether or not you've seen each other for 10, 20 years. Right. It's true. Right. Yeah, it's true. Right. Um, you're going to be in front of, I guess, a specially trained judge. I guess you could probably say that because they're very familiar with the topic. That's what they do every day. You know? I mean, there's not that much to know about yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and they certainly are not uniform. We do, well, at least they weren't. We had Judge Cohen, who recently retired. And Judge Cohen, a tough, tough domestic violence judge, in the circuit court, which means he handled the felonies. felonies. When you wanted to have a no contact order lifted, you could have your victim. Well, is it your victim? Sometimes the it's victim. the defense's victim. Yeah. Right? Sometimes it's the state's victim. Well, it's always you got both. It. Yeah. But who calls us? It's a good, good point. The victims call a lot. The victims call us. Yeah. The victims call us. Says, oh, my husband, my wife just got arrested for domestic battery. After what I called I the police, I yeah. just wanted it to stop. They took him away. Now yeah. I'm trying to have the case lifted. I'm trying to yeah. file a waiver of prosecution, and they're threatening me. They want the charges dropped. 
they want to have contact with their, you know, husband or wife or baby's father or baby's mother or whatever it may be. And they want to, essentially they want everything back to normal. Right. Which can be done, mm-hmm. but it's, it's tricky. Um, and of course we can't suborn perjury and we can't reach out to victims even if we've been told they want to have the charges dropped. When right. they come in, walk into our office <coughs> and they call us and, and, and they retain us, that's a different story. Listen, when, whenever they want to do something like that as far as dropping charges, listen, I, I have a waiver of prosecution affidavit in my desk. I never give it to them. Right. I always send them over to the victim advocate's office mm-hmm. because just like you said, I don't even want the appearance of any impropriety thinking that, oh, well, they came to him and he threw this in their face and then they signed it. Nope. Listen, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Go over, see the victim advocate. you got to make an appointment. There's a whole process that they put them through. So they go through the necessary steps, and that way you and I don't have any problems with any of that stuff. Yeah, normally a waiver of prosecution provided by the defendant's attorney to the victim isn't worth the paper that it's written on. Yeah, I've never done that. I, I stay away from that. I always send them to the victim advocate. And there's other ways to deal with, mm-hmm. with this type of a situation. But... Another thing about domestic violence cases is the surefire no contact order that is going to be assigned by the magistrate judge, who is now also the specially trained domestic violence judge. Doesn't go before the standard on duty. And that's a good point, too. Right? That's right. That's a really good point that you, you made. You got a case in front of McHugh, your first appearance is in front of McHugh. You got it. Right? Yep. yep. They do the yep, they do the first appearances and then they handle the cases also. I wonder how they do that. Is she coming in on the weekends too? Yeah. Huh. You're rotating between yeah, the felony judge? I'm not sure. That's interesting. Yeah, that's right. a good question, too. They, they've definitely changed that a lot in Broward yeah. County, but that's that's another show for sure. The no-contact order is put into place, which is not a temporary restraining order. Issues, cases, I should say, quasi-criminal, quasi-civil that are also heard on the same floor, the 10th floor uh, of, the, of the new courthouse. But uh, same effect. It's almost the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, it's... It, they're, they're both essentially orders from the judge saying that you cannot have contact with this person. Right. And what happens if the victim is in a case and there's a no contact order put in place and the victim reaches out to the defendant and says, come over, it's okay, I'm reaching out to you, and the victim comes over to the residence or it meets them in a park and it just so happens a police officer happens upon them and sees the open case. What happens? Well, listen, they can still certainly get arrested. They, they will get arrested, won't they? When, when you get into the courtroom, now I'm sure that the judge will take that into consideration if the victim says, oh, well, listen, I called him and I did this. But then the judge is going to turn to the defendant and say, listen, you knew you couldn't have contact still with her. Still violated an order. Yeah, you still violated my order. You can't have contact with her. Still violated Regardless of what he or she says. Right. Yep. And that gets into a tricky area also because you never really want your victim to have to come in and fight a small fight although that wouldn't really be a small fight because then you run the risk of the prosecutor number one learning that they're adverse to their prosecution sure number two having the opportunity to serve them with the next calendar call date Mm -hmm. i mean keep them under subpoena have them coming in because once they require you to come in you have to come in they hit you with another subpoena for as long as the litigation takes sure which is why Judge Cohen was as tough as he was. He was. He was awesome because he would let your victim, whose victim is it, the state, the defense, testify by phone that they wanted the no-contact order lifted against their boyfriend, husband, you know, right. whatever relationship they had that found them into domestic violence court. Let them appear by phone, so no slapping of subpoena telephonically. Yeah. But McHugh won't. The misdemeanor judge. Right. Right. Yeah. Different jurisdiction. Yeah. Misdemeanor I, jurisdiction. I never had that experience with Judge Cohen. You know, I never knew that. That's very interesting that he yeah, would allow that. It's a good thing that. to know. Yeah. It was, it, it, I happened upon it once. He offered it, and I couldn't believe it. But uh, he, he lived up to allowing that as, as uh, the months went on before his retirement. Now we'll see what the new judge does with this stuff, because who the judge is changes everything. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, many more caveats to domestic battery, domestic violence cases. Big difference between TROs, permanent injunctions that are held in front of Kaplan and rotating judges, as opposed to uh, the actual offenses of domestic violence, whether they be in the misdemeanor or felony courtroom. Yes. But, right, and, and call us, call either of us if you've got any questions about it. But uh, before we wrap up, I want to point something out, Bill. I was looking at uh, 
Broward County crime news on the Sun, Sun Sentinel. And I was surprised because within seven days of this being posted, and what was posted is the third safest place to live in the United States, in the whole country. The whole country. Not it, just Florida, the whole country. The whole country. Wow. And this includes Hawaii, any part of the United States, okay? We are home to the third safest place to live in the nation. And it's what? self-proclaimed. Western Florida. Western Florida. So within the days that followed, now, none of these articles, within seven days, none of these articles must have happened, or, or the facts leading up to them must have happened. And, and here it is, America's third safest city. Number three. Come on. It, it, you uh, know, in Florida, Florida that would stats. in Florida that would be impressive. But when you say in the entire U.S. the third safest city, right <clears throat> here. But you know, I wanted to um, point out that um, this was, I think, compiled in large part by a home security company. But I'm not sure. I, they must have had some FBI database information, some data pulled from legit sources. Not that ADT is not a legit source, but I'll look into that. I was more distracted by the flurry of articles on the Sun Sentinel website in the days surrounding, when I say days, within seven days. I-95, a driver fires three bullets into a truck in a road rage attack. I just pulled the gun gun ones. I heard about that one. Yep. I remember reading right. about that Just one. seven days. Hallandale High School student with loaded gun on campus arrested. I remember you know, reading about gun that gun violence one in schools, yeah. right? And that's interesting because you know Broward County, the stats with regard to murders. Oh, quoted. Parkland really threw off our stats with oh regard to the amount of ha- murders in Broward. Yeah. Taking taking Broward out of the just stellar, sure, you know, low crime. Yeah, Broward's been slipping, <laughs> according to statistics that I don't, I don't always believe. Moving on, ex-husband charged in the slaying of a woman in her Pompano Beach home. Man killed, child injured in shooting. Hollywood shopping plaza. None of this stuff must have happened in Weston. No, no. I'm moving to Weston. I just like beach too much. I can't move to Weston. Right. Uh, we had uh, <coughs> the rapper Melly uh, oh, yeah. pled this involving guns. I remember that one. Um, say man, girl, nine injured in gunfire. And, um, of course, Florida crime at an all-time 47-year low, although Broward's slipping. Broward, Broward's slipping when you go through them all, one by one. Rape, murder, robbery. But another show. Bill. But all these gun, I pulled, actually, I wanted to do an episode on um, gun control, gun crime. And then I thought to myself, hmm, how do you feel about telling our listeners your stance on gun control? Me? Yeah. I would probably not want to do that. I'm certainly out. So thanks for <laughs> listening, everybody. Until next time, you've been listening to State of Arrest. Me, William R. Moore, Bill Dorenzo. South Florida Criminal Defense Attorneys, we hope you enjoyed the show. Until next time, thanks a lot.